start, huh? Yeah. All glory to the one who speaks through his word. Praise the Lord for a great start. We now we asked Randy if he would help us to follow the Savior who is building through the Gospels. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 says these things are recorded for our benefit. And so we're going to pictorially look at an example in Scripture all week long in these sessions of, of how the Lord leads his people into battle. And our prayer before God is that this would be as practical and helpful as it could possibly be. Um, yeah, the missionary heart of God is the, is the title of this session. The missionary heart of God. Okay, let's read Joshua 1, 1 through verse number 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor, dismay, nor dismayed, for the Lord God, your God, is with you wherever you go. Okay, let's bow our heads. Father, you spoke to us in, in this first morning session. We just want to pause and say thank you. Lord, your word says it very simply. If anyone speaks, let him speak as an oracle of God. So in faith, in response to the word of God, in confidence in our God, we pray that you would continue to speak to us all week long. Pray that this session would be... Um, whatever you want it to be. And we pray that your people moving forward would be whatever you want them to be, starting with me. Take our lives and let us be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Father, thank you for the word of God. Help us, help us, help us to be wise. Help us to understand it. Help us to see why Joshua was recorded for our benefit. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord, amen. So the missionary heart of God, Jesus said, I will build my church. And I'm happy to repeat this. Jesus is the most passionate, focused, capable, skillful, dedicated, tender-hearted missionary of all time. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Anything that you try to do for the Lord makes you, makes you end up standing in awe of Him, doesn't it? You try to shepherd people. I remember Bob Brown years ago saying the sheep will bite you. Um, the, sheep will, the sheep will kick you. Right? The true test of a shepherd is if you continue to shepherd like after you're treated that way. Anything you try to do for the Lord, when you suffer for it, um, boy, it makes you stand in awe of the one who said, he will not fail. I will not fail nor be discouraged. Yeah, what a Savior. You know, if we, if we have the time to read through the Word of God, Genesis to Revelation, and we were just looking for the meta-narrative, the, the main theme of Scripture, what, would we, what we would come up with is that our God is a missionary God. 
He had a redemptive plan before the foundation of the world, and he skillfully worked out that redemptive plan despite Satan's opposition and humankind's opposition throughout all of history. He has won. He is winning. He will win. So the missionary heart of God. You cannot follow the Savior who is building without ending up the missionary heart of God rubbing off on you. Thinking how He thinks, feeling how He feels, seeing how He sees. Yeah, I desperately need that every day. Yeah. In the presence of God, I say this with a completely clear conscience, I love and thank God for the team, the missionary team that I live and work among in California. Oh, I love and thank God for every single one. That doesn't change the fact that I need to almost daily pray, Lord, let me see Christ in your servants. And it's not because I struggle with them. I so thank God to the point of tears. I thank God for them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's make uh, five observations from the text this morning in verses 1 through 9. Observation number 1 is transition. So let's read verse number, verse number 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying... What I want to highlight in this verse is, is it constantly refers to time frame. After the death of Moses. By the way, I love the title. I mean, it's right there in the text. Like, and this is so instructional. Right? Somewhere around six times in the scripture, you find the, the term leader. 900 plus times in the scripture, you find the word servant. We could never aspire to anything greater than just being servants of God, could we? Yeah, it's, it's encouraging. It's right there. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. So that's a time frame. Right? Moses represented a tremendous work of God. Have you ever studied Moses' life? Ever just delighted in Moses' life? So many incredible lessons. He represented one of the great periods in biblical history. Such a rich time. One of the, one of the periods that we saw miracles. 50 to 70 years that, that we see miracles as normative in biblical history. Moses was one of these periods, and our brother referred to it. A staff being turned into a snake and then back into a staff. The rod of Moses becoming the rod of God. An incredible time. We thank God for Moses. We thank God for that time period. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, that's another reference to time, that the Lord spoke to Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying. So here are the children of God, the children of Israel. They learned to follow Moses. They wanted to kill him from time to time. They murmured and complained against him. Right? He interceded for them. I think all of us would say, incredible man of God, meekest man right, in all the earth, represented a tremendous work of God in his day. And then, but, but in our little stage in history here, Moses, my servant, is dead. And so now, it came to pass, like in the right time, the Lord now speaks to Joshua. And so what I want you to notice is the transition. This is a transition from a previous great work of God to a future great work of God. As much as we can, would you try to, again, use your sanctified iman- imagination like Randy said, and just try to imagine what Joshua was feeling at this moment. I don't know that he feels anything like me, but if he does feel anything like me, it's really easy for me to look at, at men and women of God, like to read their biographies, and to think, of course he used them. Look at their lives, you know? But then when Moses, my servant, is dead... And when it starts to fall to you, well, you feel completely differently than that. Does anybody in the room think, of course God would use me? (laughs) The church is lucky to have me. (laughs) These thoughts have never entered our head. And God help us if they ever did. If they ever did enter our head. Yeah, I, I would imagine Joshua was terrified. It calls him Moses' assistant. The Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Steve Price asked me to go to Turkey Hill and direct, and 
I said, I've never directed anything. I'm horrible at details. I'm right about that, by the way. That's not false humility. Um, yeah, and then I, I grew to where I really loved directing. And then he said, hey, I want to go and I'll speak in the morning, you speak at night. And I was like, I've never done that. Everything that came along was terrifying. Everything that still comes along is terrifying. Yeah. I can imagine Joshua was saying, I got really comfortable being number two. Right? I got really comfortable supporting Moses, but now Moses, my servant, is dead. And so in the perfect time, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua. So let me say this with very much reverence and thanksgiving to God. Um, Detweiler, my servant, is dead. McKay, my servant, is dead. Whitfield, right, a little more broadly known. In this region, those names that I mentioned are very well known. And we thank God for the work of God that they represent. Amen? Just like Moses. Whitfield, Wesley, Moody, man, they represent tremendous works of God. I read their books and I think, of course, God used them. Like, look at their discipline. Look at the way that they knew the Word of God. Look at what time they got up in the morning. Like, it never surprises me that the Lord uses Moses. By the way, there's a book, um, Christ in the Camp. It's about Moody and, and others that preached the gospel in both the northern camps in the Civil War and in the southern camps in the Civil War and the revivals that they saw during that time. Incredible works of God. Christ in the Camp. It's a worthy read. And if you love history, it's a combination of a great work of God and amazing American history. Thank God for all the Moseses. I learned, I learned uh, three days ago from my aunt, Lavon that Hayes Hunt, I don't know if anybody, does anybody know that name? Okay, so Hayes Hunt came to a, a homestead that my great, great, if I'm, un, if I'm remembering correctly, great, great, great grandfather homesteaded in Kansas in the 1800s. My great, great uncle was farming it at the time in Atchison, Kansas. Atchison, Kansas had more millionaires than anywhere else in the United States in that period of history. People on the East Coast, this goes way, way back. People on the East Coast would sell everything they had. They would come out to Atchison, Kansas. They would purchase everything they wanted to take west. And then they would, and then they would, um, yeah, they would purchase from the vendors in Atchison, Kansas, everything that they were going to take with them. Then they would load a wagon train and they would head off to, the, to find their dreams in the west. And it made these people millionaires. Hayes Hunt came and asked if he could set up a tent. And my great, great uncle said, please. And they set up a tent in Atchison, Kansas, and uh, he preached the gospel. And every DeGroff in Atchison, Kansas accepted Christ, except for one. He moved to California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that work of God means the world to me. It's four generations ago. So Hayes Hunt, my servant, is dead. And we're not saying it in a negative way. We're saying, um, and I, I'll say this as delicately as I possibly can, but I feel utterly compelled just to say it out loud. We, to a significant degree, are a leftover of a great work of God from a former generation. Now, if that was my only point, I would feel I would be sinning in the presence of God. This is just point number one. But we are in a point in history where Moses, my servant, is dead. And then we're in a point in history where we need, this will go to our prayer request. We'll have a prayer time immediately following this. This would immediately speak to that, right, prayer times. We need the Lord to be speaking to Joshua all across North America, all around the world. Yeah, we need the Joshua's. Caleb Trent sent this to our team the other day. If you were born between 1925 and 1945, there's a 60% chance that you're in church today. If you were born between 1946 and 1964, there's a 40% chance you're in church today. If you were born between 1965 and 1983, there's a 20% chance you're in church today. That's me. If you were born after 1984, there's less than a 10% chance that you're in church today. That's from uh, the missiologist Alan Roxburgh from a book called Remaking Church, Changing the World. Um, 
All I'm doing is just illustrating the fact that Moses, my servant, is dead. We praise God for Moses. We praise God for the great work of God that he represents. And now we look to the tiny little servants that are called Joshua. We look to God to speak to them. And we look to God to lead them into the harvest. Yeah. So point of application, we are at a moment in history. We are at a moment in history. Remember Jeremiah? It says the people went backward and not forward. Yeah, I have a simple prayer request. I'd love for us to pray this together after this meeting. If Jesus Christ came down and stood next to me and said, Scott, you can ask one thing. This is what I would say. I'd say, Lord, I, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that by your mighty power that the church of God would go forward and not backward. That it would be fully biblical. That the gospel would come not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit. That they would be counted worthy of their calling in the next generation and that every work of faith would be accomplished by Holy Spirit power. That you would fill them with hope. My entire prayer would just be the church moving forward in the next generation. So we look, we observe in the scripture that this is a moment in history really easy to look back and say, man, I, I miss Moses. Boyd Nicholson got on his knees in St. Catharines, Ontario years ago with other very godly men. I think there were five of them, if I remember right. They had a map of St. Catharines, Ontario. They got on their knees. They prayed for a season. Then they opened their eyes. They said, how many sections in this community do you see? They all agreed together there were five sections. Then they prayed again. They came to the conclusion that the Lord was wanting, He was desiring five new works in each of these five sections. And then they set about working. They broke bread where they already were, and then they would come meet in a park, and they would do a Sunday school in a park in one of the sections, one of the boroughs. They would start to see people saved, then they would see the kids saved, and then they would see families saved, then they would start a Bible study, then they would start an assembly. Then now you have two places, and they would break bread in both of those places, and then both of those places would go to a park. They would see kids saved, then they would see families saved, then they would see a Bible study started, then they had assemblies, right? They just systematically worked. Once the Lord led them, they systematically worked forward. So we thank God for Boyd Nicholson. Amen? Amen. He was a Moses. Man, praise God for the work of God that he represents. We are at a moment in history. Yeah, will the people of God go forward? I think what we decide in this room this week will affect that. Would you agree with me about that? I think that most of us in this room a long time ago passed the line, passed over the line of being doubly accountable in the presence of God. Not many of you should be teachers. That's most of us, right? Doubly accountable in the presence of God. You're shepherds, you're leaders. What we decide, what we pray, what we choose to live or not live will have a drastic impact on the next generation. Yeah. God help us. Observation number two in the, in the text. Uh, point number two in my outline is provision. Provision. Look at verse number two. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you, that's Joshua, and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. I want you to notice three provisions in the text. Provision number one, Joshua. Praise the Lord for Joshua, huh? Joshua could easily get into the game of thinking all the things that he's not like Moses. Moses the shepherd spent 40 years being prepared by God in the back of the desert for a specific work that Moses was called to. Man, Joshua, he could really get hamstrung. He could really get tripped up by thinking, oh, I'm just not Moses. That's such a lie of the devil. I mean, Moses didn't even believe he was Moses. You remember? Right? I don't speak well. And the Lord, I love it. The Lord says, I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what you should say. So Joshua was called for a radically different purpose, and he was a different man than Moses. He didn't have Moses' strengths, but he didn't have Moses' weaknesses either. And he was built perfectly by God. I'm thankful to be in a room. This is just good theology, what I'm about to say. 
I'm thankful to be in a, a room full of people that are perfectly built by God. Amen? I know we fall short, right? I know James 3 is true. Like, we all stumble in many ways. Me, chief of more than anybody else here. But everyone here is perfectly built by God. Everyone here, Ephesians 2.10, predestined our good works beforehand that we should walk in them. He's got it all sorted out. We choose to go forward in a completely wholly yielded way or we choose to draw lines. I'll follow you up to this point. I'm not going to go any further than that. Yeah, perfectly built by God. Joshua was perfectly built by God. He's a provision. You know, I'm happy to say this. Um, I think some of you probably see this. And then I think many of you maybe don't um, have the privilege of seeing this. But God is raising up Joshua's literally in every corner of North America. And I'm thinking of specific people. I won't put any burden on them by naming them. Like, there's no point. But specific people that the living God is raising up. One way that I recognize them, they're men that follow Jesus Christ into a prayer closet. Many of them spent a year in their prayer closet, just them and the Lord, and they have the whole thing chronicled in their prayer journal. And then they came out after a year in their prayer closet, and they have a specific burden, just like it doesn't matter who it was. Somebody prayed that the Lord would burden Joshua's for their region of the country. Somebody prayed that. They come out of their prayer closet with a specific burden given to them by the head of the church in a prayer closet, and they begin to pray in the Spirit, Ephesians 6 and Jude 20 and 21, and then when they start to pray in the Spirit, they start to slowly and incrementally and powerfully see the hand of God move. Man, how could we not thank God for Joshua's that he's raising up all over the country? And I mean it, literally every corner of the continent. Praise God for Joshua's. Uh, the second thing that he, that he provides in this verse is all the people. Right there in the middle of the verse, he says, Arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people. 580 million souls in North America. Does that seem daunting? I remember a time where that was almost an unfathomable number. Like I could barely get the words out of my mouth. 580 million souls. I don't want to be overly simplistic, um, but there's a truth here that, that is biblical. Um, I guess I think of, of how will they hear without a preacher? And then there's a truth that it's not very mysterious. 580 million souls, like somebody just has to go. The work will either be done or not done. We live in the West. The Lord has set the West in front of us. Phoenix, Vegas, Reno, Salt Lake City, Boise, Helena, Portland, and Seattle. Right? So that, this is how the Lord has directed us. Like, start here, Freedom Watsonville, California. Move here. Keep moving. Like, the burden is all of North America. We're believing the Lord Jesus to reach, effectively reach, all of North America in the next generation. 374 unreached people groups in the United States and Canada. Rich Brown taught me that wherever Rich is. Yeah, and I said, that's such an important statistic. Would you send me the PowerPoint? Like, send me where you're getting your data. And he did, and I have it on my computer. It was 348, and then it grew by 26 because the Lord allowed people from every one of the 26 provinces in Afghanistan to, come, to immigrate to the United States and Canada in the last number of years. If you know Jesus, then you know he loves the lost with a passionate, focused love that we cannot wrap our little heads around. Amen? And if you know that Jesus, then you know that He's standing here saying, you don't even need a, you don't even need a passport now to reach them. Look, we asked, Tra where's Travis and Joanna? Yeah, back there. That's Travis Robertson. He's going to give a seminar we asked him to give the seminar on reaching immigrants because um, they're doing the work. And he'll tell you, go ask him like how simple it is. You take them to the grocery store. They've never been to a grocery store like, like what we go to. It's totally overwhelming to them. Have them, over, have them over to your home. Most of the cultures, at least many of the cultures that they come from, as soon as you have someone into your home, you're friends. The Lord Jesus loves these people. You all have people in your lives that you love, right? Right? like that you desperately love, that you would do anything to save 
if they were in danger of being horrifically treated by an evil man and you could reach out your hand and save them? What if they were just drowning in a pool and you could reach out your hand and save the people that you genuinely care about the most? And then if you're anything like me, let that shed light on the way that Jesus Christ looks at lost people, the way that Jesus Christ looks at the world being sent to North America in our generation, and the missiology, like the, the genuine opportunity that stands before the church because of these trends. Man, I'm thankful for souls. Yeah, Lord, do the work. It's not mysterious. It's little people Man, I, I, when we moved to California, I just felt utterly exposed. And, and to my knowledge, everybody that has moved to California, like on our missionary team, everyone just kind of feels undone, exposed, like a little kid, helpless, like, like I was really comfortable in my ministry before. Everything was just rolling, flying first class around the world, eating awesome food. And then here, you direct me this way, like it's so uncomfortable. You just feel like this is, I'm so ill-equipped for this. You feel like Moses did when Moses, before Moses was Moses. And Joshua, I think, would before Joshua becomes Joshua. Yeah. So God provided Joshua. God provided all this people. And my point is, we're going to need the workers. Do you think it's a legitimate goal to say there's 374 unreached people groups in the United States and Canada? We should take seriously reaching those people in the next 20 years. Is that a legitimate goal for us? Do you believe that that goal is on Jesus' heart? If it's on His heart, then maybe we should really take it seriously. Maybe the Lord would use us. I know the Lord wants to use us. Yeah, and I know that He's all about it. This is God's heart. Yeah. So 580 million souls, we believe God to do this. Yeah, the effective reaching of North America with the gospel in the next generation. Moses is dead. We're in a transition. Now it's time for Joshua's. He provided Joshua's. God is providing Joshua's. He provided all this people. We need all this people. And then the third thing that you see in the verse, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them. If you're taking notes, just jot down, he provided the battle. Here, of course, it's a physical battle. 1 Corinthians 10, these things are recorded for your benefit. So we're thinking as New Testament Christians, right? And we're looking at the battle. Wage the good warfare. Fight the good fight of faith. Fulfill your ministry. Be worthy of the calling wherewith you are called. Like, we're thinking of it that way. God has provided an amazing battle. Yeah, praise God. We were in Salt Lake about four weeks ago, I think, to pray for a week. Such a delight to my heart. Two million people in Salt Lake City. One million Mormons. I found that oddly encouraging. Like, they're not all Mormons. You know? Yeah. Satan is super happy with Salt Lake because you have an incredibly outspoken LGBTQ community. And they see the falseness of Mormonism. Do you see the falseness of Mormonism? Amen. So we agree with them about that. They see it, and they hate it. I hate false religion. And then this community, right, this community looks at them, and they look down their noses like the religious hypocrites, right, the, or the religious pride. They look at this community with hatred. This community looks at this community with hatred, and Satan is pleased with both. And as long as he can keep them fighting each other, he's just happy because they're going to be distracted all the way to hell. And so Salt Lake City needs somebody to... Salt Lake City needs somebody to just go there and do the work. Amen? Two million people. Last year we were in Vegas. Used to hate Vegas. And I mean it. I'm saying this to my shame. I used to hate it. I used to go there for business. I went there with good news on the move. We spent a week on the strip. Yeah. Reaching out with Christ, for Christ every day on the strip. Man, it was good to be out of there. Um. Before I went that week, I, I was in the pulpit in my commanding assembly, and I joked with them. I'm ashamed of this. I joked with them, uh, just pray the Lord holds off the lightning and the fire and brimstone before till we get out of the city. But that betrayed the thoughts of my heart. There are two million people in Las Vegas in the greater area as well. 
one of the fastest city, growing cities in America, 300,000 visitors a week from all over the world. It's a crossroads of the world. You cannot read your New Testament without coming to the conclusion that these are one of the cities that Paul would go to. And what's an amazing privilege is, is to go to these places. Um, I actually did this. It was a remarkable, this is just my little testimony, but it was a remarkable day. I prayed that the Lord would help me only to see souls. Because I'm going down to the strip in Las Vegas. But, and I knew God's assurance. My grace is sufficient. And I claimed that in the morning. And then we went down to the, the strip and all day long, all I saw was souls. Somebody's got to go to Vegas. I can't, I can't wait to see the Lord do exactly what the Scripture says. Pray the Lord of the harvest that He would raise up workers to send out into the harvest. I can't wait to see Him do it. He's good for it, isn't He? It's He taught us to pray that way. In full faith, in absolute bold confidence, we pray that way. We know His heart. Remember how God talked to Jonah about Nineveh? It's a great city. It's a great city. It's an exceedingly great city. Man, it's fun these days to go in fellowship with God over His love for these cities. Exceedingly great cities. Knowing that He plans to do a work in these places. Such a delight. Remember Luke 19, the Jesus that wept over the city of Jerusalem? Yeah, it's really something to walk every day with the, the Savior who weeps over cities who throws parties when a soul gets saved, and then he weeps over, over when they reject. Yeah, And he's left it to you and me to go and get them. It's just work. It's just work. It's just work. It has to be done. Again, I don't mean to be overly simplistic, but, but I know that there's clear biblical evidence for what I'm saying. Yeah, how will they hear without a preacher? So who will go? Who will go for God? The main point here is the provision of God. He provided Joshua. He provided all this people. He provided the battle. Um, yeah, point of application. If you're taking notes, I love this. Are you ready? Point of application. We have a warrior God. <laughs> we have a warrior God. And then if you're jotting that down, with a passionate missionary heart. How beautiful is that God? A little hard not to sing. We have a warrior God. In Exodus 14, 15, it says, um, the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. The title, the Lord of hosts, means Lord of the armies. We have a warrior God with a missionary heart. What a privilege to follow a, a leader like that. What a privilege to follow a leader like that. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, pray for all men. Verse 4 answers the question, why? Because God desires all men to, come, to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And then verse 6, why, again, he gave himself a ransom for all. Pray for all men. Why? He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? He gave himself a ransom for all. It's all right there, 1 Timothy 1 through 6. Yeah, so beautiful. Okay, point three, victory. Point three in the outline, victory. Let's read verse three and four. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Victory. In other words, we're guaranteed victory. Little Joshua, who was not Moses, he's being told by God, I guarantee you victory. Yeah, there's something I want you to notice here. The God who speaks in verse 2, he says this, to the land which I am giving to them. So please notice, right, careful Bible students, I am giving to them. And then verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. I just noticed this a few days ago. Yeah, point of application, if you're taking notes, I love the have given God. Yeah, I love the have, and give, the have given God. Craig, I thought of you as soon as I noticed this. Um, 
Every work of God is accompanied by, by songs that are precious to that work, right? I think that this concept is worth a song. Yeah. If, in fact, I started it for you. Yeah. Yeah. I praise the name of the have given God. I praise his name forevermore. For endless days will go forward with his praise. The great, awesome, have given God. <laughs> That's the chorus. Yeah. I really, I really honestly think it's worthy, of a, it's worthy of remembrance. It's significant what God is doing in the verse. I have given you. What does it mean to the Phoenix team? In the Lord's time, they'll launch to Phoenix, Arizona, somewhere around 5 million people in the greater area. I looked it up again yesterday. 5 million people. What does it mean to the Phoenix team that they get to enter into that land with million upon million upon million upon million upon million people, a vast land filled with giants? What does it mean to that missionary team that God is building right in front of our eyes that they get to follow the have-given God? They get to hold on to their shield of faith. We believe in God. We don't believe in what we see around us. We don't believe in our circumstances. We don't believe in our feelings. We believe in the have-given God. This is where God has led us. This is the mission field that God has sent us to. We believe in the have-given God. Amen? It, it kind of means everything. I had an awesome moment with the Lord in Vegas when we were there praying. We have a North American map that we've used from the beginning. And as the Lord leads, we just keep marking where the Lord is raising up Joshua's and where the Lord is forming teams and the burdens that the Lord gives. Like we, we're just observing God. It's like Lord of the Rings times a billion, right? It's, it's just, it's the most amazing movie I've ever seen in my life times a billion, just watching Jesus Christ go forward. So just, just, it was during a break and I just went in quietly to where the map was and I put my hand along the West Coast of the United States and I just praised God. I praised God for the have given God. I didn't use those words, but I thank God for what he plans to do. I'm just saying it by faith. I believe in God. Is that a fair statement? So I just praised him, worshiped him, just, just he and I. And then I put my hand on this, the prairies in Canada and I just praised God for what he's already done, a lion and a bear. They're thankful for the victories over the lion and the bear, but they're looking for the victory over Goliath. And I just worship God for what he plans to do in the prairies in Canada. And then Ontario, southern Ontario, I see a Joshua there. And I just praise God for what he plans to do in that place. And then the east coast, same thing. And then I, in something I think, I don't know, miraculous probably isn't the right word, but I don't know what the right word would be. Something happened in that moment, um, and it was this. North America, which has been unfathomably huge, and seemingly unconquerable, just became really small. Like once I put my hand here and said, you're moving here. Once I put my hand here, you're moving here. Once, once I put my hand here, you're moving here. And then I put my hand here. It just, this, this North American map, it just was like, oh, the Lord's going to actually do this. That's a statement of my weakness, my fability, right? The Lord is granting me faith. Yeah. He, the am giving God in verse 3, shows himself to be the, the have-given God. So point of application, I love the have-given God. Uh, point number four, presence. Presence. Look at verse 5. It's P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, presence. Verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. What I want to say is a simple little statement, but it's utterly essential. The Lord taught us before we ever launched to California, the Lord taught us you will live or die with the presence of God. And I want to see this in the text. And then I want to refer to a bunch of texts because this is, this is the whole of the canon wide, this principle. So here he says, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. 
So he gives them an immense task, an overwhelming task, and then he promises them his presence. These people would live or die physically with or without the presence of God. Amen? You and I as New Testament Christians, we will live or die in a different sense. We will live or die in the sense that will there be success in our mission? I immediately think of, the, the, of Paul's prayer. This prayer, don't turn there, but this prayer. Therefore we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of your calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. His power. In other words, whether or not they would be counted worthy of their calling was worth praying about. Will we be counted worthy of our calling? That's worth praying about, according to Paul. Will, will what's set before us, the, the immense, overwhelming task that's set before us, will it be accomplished by Holy Spirit power, like Paul is praying here in Thessalonians? That the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in Him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Beautiful prayer. We live or die with the presence of God. What about other examples? Moses, right? I referred to it. Uh, I don't speak well. I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what you should say. Exodus 33, if your presence doesn't go up with me, I don't want to go. My presence shall go with you. Then here, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. In Solomon's life, consider now, remember when Solomon was little in the, in the eyes of God? When Solomon viewed Solomon as little? He said, I'm like a little kid. Who am I to lead these people out and in? Right? And then, and then these amazing verses in Chronicles. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you. Be strong and of good courage and do it. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work. In other words, when there's an immense task set before you, my presence will go with you, God says. It's universal in the Scripture. Matthew 28. It's so famous, I'll put it in my own words. I want you to go after the whole world. I want you to go get all of them. Make disciples everywhere. I love them with a passionate, focused love. You spent time with me. You know me. You know my manner of life. You know why I died, why I was resurrected. Now, I want you to go, and I want you to get everybody. And then, of course, famously, he says, what lo, I am with you always. He gives you an overwhelming task, and then he promises his presence. Hebrews 13.5, for, for our dispensation, records this verse, verse number five. He will not leave you nor forsake you. If you go and dig into those words, it's incredibly encouraging. In the Greek, I will not walk away from you. These are things we hold on to with our shield of faith. I will not walk away from you. I will not cease to strongly support you. Leave and forsake. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Revelation 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and fellowship with him and he with me. James 4, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. My point is that from Genesis to Revelation, God believes that the presence of God is essential. And he assures it whenever he gives his people an immense task. The one that has so encouraged me, this is so instructional to us, Again, don't turn for sake of time. If you want to put it in your notes, it's Acts 10 and verse number 38 says this. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. If God was with God, we heard about that this morning from Randy. If God was with God, do you think it would be fair for us to say that we are in desperate need of God being with us? Yeah. So you go forward, and, and he promises his presence. To me, the saddest verse in all the word of God, uh, Judges, he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. There's a difference between positional truth and practical truth. I hope that that's a hearty amen in this room. There's a difference between the positional truth that the Holy Spirit will not be taken from us. Therefore, we don't pray the same prayers, like take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Right? There's a difference between that truth, which I completely 100% affirm, and the hand of the Lord was with them, or God being with them. That's a reference to the fullness of his power. 
right? God being with God in Acts 10.38. And then constantly, the hand of the Lord was with them all the way through the book of Acts. Here on the edge of an incredible, overwhelming battle. I will be with you. Okay, point five. Exhortation times three. Point five is exhortation times three. Verse number six, seven, and nine. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. I'm going to read 8 too. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Finally, have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed for the Lord God, your God, is with you wherever you go. Please notice with the minutes that we have left. Please notice that three times the living God looks at the future warriors and he says, be strong and courageous, be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor dismayed. Would you agree with me that we live in a day where we need to to fully heed this admonition? I take, I take comfort in the fact that the Lord sees right through me like He knows exactly what I mean. I'm not complaining. I've never been happier serving the Lord in all my life, and I don't want any detail of my life to be different than what it is. Um, moving to a mission field, like many of you know this, of course. Moving to a mission field, not easy. Not comfortable. You know the greatest struggle that I see? We have five missionary families on our team. You know the greatest struggle that I see? I actually saw Satan attacking. It took me a couple months to, to pray and discern it before the Lord, but I saw Satan attacking in a very specific way. And to this day, like five and a half years into our missionary journey, the greatest struggle that I see on the missionary team, leaving behind family. And it fits with Matthew 19. Right? When Peter looks at Jesus and says, those of us that have left all to follow you, what shall we have? In the Lord Jesus' very gracious answer, he says, you that have left all for my name, you shall have, right? and he makes some awesome promises, but then he says, you that have left, do you remember the list? Houses and lands, that's two. But between those, he lists six, six family relationships. Have you ever noticed that? He says, houses, lands, this is Matthew 19, and then he lists six family relationships. We've almost lost several families due to this struggle. It's no fun, right? Mom has gallbladder attack, feels like she's dying. I'm in California. That's no fun. We live in a day where the servants of God, we say this all the time, not because we think we are, but because we desperately want the Lord to make us. We must be good soldiers of Christ Jesus. We must be good soldiers of Christ Jesus. No soldier enlisted in active duty entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please the one that enlisted him as soldier. Let the dead bury their own dead. You that have left all to follow me. Luke 14, no one can be my disciple unless he forsakes all and follows me. The Lord doesn't call everybody to the same thing. Praise God. But man, we live in a day. I think we would resoundingly agree with this and we could pray this together. Where the people of God would fully receive the trifold admonition of a holy God. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor dismayed. Powerful, powerful, powerful admonitions. Okay, point six. We have one minute. Point six. This is application. And then um, I'm going to sit down and we're going to have about 15 minutes of prayer. Praise the Lord. And then um, a brother will come close us off in 15 minutes. Application. You ready? Letter A. Missio Deo. Missio Deo. God is on a mission. It's application letter A. Missio Deo. God is on a mission. We have a warrior God with a missionary heart. Be perfectly appropriate to praise and worship him after this, but also to ask us to be a people that would reflect that. 
Application letter B. We are at a moment in history. What will we do? Application letter C. We can have radical confidence in our have-given God. Here's a detail that I didn't really say earlier. We don't know how the Lord is going to accomplish His, his reaching of North America. Amen? But we do know if. We do know if. The captain of salvation will do the right thing. The Lord of the harvest will function in that role perfectly. Amen? So we don't know how He's going to do it, nor do I care. That's way above our pay grade. We just know if. We know if he's going to do it. Application letter D, Christ believed his presence was essential. And I'm citing as my authority, Matthew chapter 28. Christ believed that his presence was essential to the mission. Lo, I am with you always. Application letter E, we must be good soldiers. We must be strong and courageous. Amen.